This is CBC Here and Now. Tonight, an act of violence. A South Coast community is grieving after a Con River woman was killed last night. And a cab driver in Happy Valley Goose Bay accused of assaulting a young girl. Today, a courtroom hears her story. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Debbie Cooper. And let's get to that top story. 28-year-old... 28-year-old Chantel John was killed last night in Con River. The Miapukek First Nation says she died tragically in a horrible act of violence. Here now's Garrett Barry is in the community and has this report. The police presence is actually ramping up here with more officers arriving over the past few hours, but I want to bring your attention over here. What you see is a red dress hung from a tree not even a hundred feet from the scene that police are holding. This is a powerful symbol for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. In a statement, the Myopakek First Nation says that Chantal John was taken from the community in a horrible act of violence. It says her murder proves that missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls is a crisis that has no boundaries. Police arrived last night and are still holding the scene guarding two homes in the community. The RCMP have said little about the incident other than to call it a suspicious death that they're actively investigating. They will not say whether anyone has been taken into custody or if there are any suspects. But Chief Mizel Joe tells CBC News that a man has been arrested in connection with John's death. The First Nation opened up the Community Family Center for support and counseling this afternoon and will have support available for students in the school as well. The tragedy is the focus of this community and some residents are saying they can't remember the last time something like this happened in Con River. There are more red dresses going up in the community you can see from the streets and the Muabakek First Nation is asking everyone in the community to wear red tomorrow to honor the memory of Chantal John. Garrett Barry, CBC News, Con River. Bank Council Chief Michel Joe is stuck in St. John's today because of the freezing rain, but he says he is keeping in close contact with the community and with police. And he says Con River has received an outpouring of support. Uh, first of all, you know, I want to thank the many people that sent in through their condolences to our community. And I spoke to the Premier this morning, spoke to the RCMP earlier this afternoon. And uh, been in touch since 11.30 last night with the community. It affects the whole community. I think it's necessary to be talking about uh, murder and missing women and what happens to us in a small community. Sometimes we, uh, we think because we're a small community, it can't happen to us, but it do oftentimes bring it home to us. As you heard in Garrett's report, the police investigation into Chantel John's death does continue. And while Chief Joe is calling it a murder, the RCMP have not ruled John's death a homicide. They're calling it suspicious, and they haven't said how the woman died. At this moment, RCMP remain on scene investigating the incident. The Office of the Chief Medical Examiner has also been engaged. And uh, is there a suspect or anything like that that, that you know of? Um, we're really not able to confirm that information at this time. A Happy Valley Goose Bay cab driver has been accused of sexually assaulting a 14-year-old girl. She says Joseph Cooney threatened to kill her if she told anyone. The 65-year-old man faces multiple charges, including sexual assault and forcible confinement. Jacob Barker was in the courtroom and has this report. Well, the teenage girl became emotional today as she was asked to step out from behind a privacy screen and identify Joseph Cooney, which she did. Most of her testimony, though, came by way of a video RCMP statement that she gave two days after the alleged incident occurred. In it, she described the night of June 2nd, 2017. She said she knew Cooney. She had ridden in his cab before with a friend and he'd been friendly. She initially declined the ride he offered to her that night, but eventually got in. She said he drove her to his house. On the way, he asked how old she was, and he didn't react when she told him she was 14. Once at home, she described the sexual assault, which included intercourse, and that he stopped when she asked him to. When asked by the Crown attorney whether she wanted to have sex with Cooney, 
She said, no, this trial has been plagued with delays due to a very busy docket, as well as technical difficulties connecting with an RCMP witness in Moncton and a defense lawyer in Wabush. The teen still has to face some questioning from the Crown as well as cross-examination. A date for those proceedings will be set next week. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. It was a treacherous morning for much of eastern Newfoundland. Freezing rain delayed school openings, flights, and ferry crossings. It also made it very difficult and sometimes dangerous just to get around. Here and now's Carolyn Stokes has more. Well, you don't need to be here at the Loop to go for a skate in St. John's. The entire city woke up to a thick sheet of ice covering pretty much everything. But you'll want to leave these at home today to get around the city and wear these instead. It was a delicate dance with the ice underfoot as students made their way to class at Memorial University. I don't care about the weather. <laughs> I think it should be snowing in the winter, but why? It's raining. It's raining. And with all this rain, pedestrians faced two big challenges. Don't slip on the icy sidewalk and don't get splashed by passing cars. Very, very bad. I was slipping and sliding all over the place. Very treacherous, very treacherous. There were delayed school openings in the metro area, but it wasn't just pedestrians who had a hard go of it this morning. Before hitting those greasy streets, drivers needed a good dose of elbow grease. I chiseled the ice off the windshield and I went to the Y at 5.30. I didn't walk it, I skated out. <laughs> And that mixture of ice and rain was a dangerous combination for vehicles on the morning commute, although there were no reports of any major weather-related accidents. And by the afternoon, the ice had finally melted, but it's still a good idea to watch your step. Carolyn Stokes, CBC News, St. John's. Well, there were a number of puddles like that uh, all around the city because uh, we saw lots of rain this afternoon. If we take a look at the current satellite and radar, you can see we're still hanging on to that potential for rain right across the Avalon. And then some freezing rain still possible up through parts of central and eastern Newfoundland as we head through the night tonight. And then we've got freezing drizzle advisories in place along the uh, coast of Labrador and then down through the Bayvert Peninsula and that's because we're in that northerly flow northeasterly flow and that will continue through most of the night tonight and even through the first half of tomorrow it looks like along with some blowing snow advisories for the northern portions of um, Labrador. We're looking at about 20 to even 30 centimeters of snow by the time Saturday rolls around along with some blowing snow. And then we've got colder air moving in, which means we've got the perfect setup for snow squalls. I'll have all those details and your full forecast coming up. The invasion continues. Roddickton Bide Arm has been inundated with dozens of harp seals and they're not camera shy either. The latest from DFO is coming up. Well, it's a provincial election year, and it appears the campaigning has already begun. In his first public speech of 2019, Premier Dwight Ball came out swinging at progressive conservative leader Chess Crosby. Here and now's Mark Quinn was there. And I will make a few little political jabs to start the new year. Dwight Ball listed what he sees as some of the Liberal government's accomplishments, more employment in the province than in 2010, and forecasts of economic growth but he also took aim at political opponent Chess Crosby and his comments on power rate mitigation. Chess is now telling the people that's province the only option is what we need some sort of a bailout from the federal government. Well, the bailout that he's talking about is a bailout of PC decision. After the rotary lunch wrapped up, Ball turned his attention to Crosby again. There was no options that came from Chess Crosby, never asked. He doesn't even think today that, pro that the Muskrat Falls was a mistake. So what is Ball's plan to mitigate rates? He says the government is looking forward to the PUB's interim report on rate mitigation next month and talking to the federal government too. But he also wasn't ready to give any specifics yet. PC's got us into this situation. As a Liberal government, we're going to work our way out of this and we will do some work within our province, things that we can do with effectively reduce rates for people in our province, and we'll do so working with the federal government. Ball said the government is still planning for a fall election, 
Ball also said he'll be running as the leader of the Liberal Party and, quote, he can't wait. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Lawyers at the Muskrat Falls Inquiry are looking for more information about why the project is so far over budget. They're looking to speak with people who have worked on the project and are asking anyone with insight to come forward. The public inquiry starts up again in February. Phase two will focus on costs and overruns. The registered nurses union is calling on Eastern Health to put an end to mandatory 24-hour nursing shifts. The union says a lack of staff means that nurses are forced to work around the clock, which is putting nurses and their patients at risk. Union President Debbie Forward says nurses are treating patients while they are sleep deprived. And she says it's been happening for months and she is calling on Eastern Health to increase staffing in order to meet patient demand. The health authority has not said that it will hire more staff. Instead, it's focusing on managing the nurses who are already there. We have more for you tonight on those seals taking over Roddickton Bide Arm on the Northern Peninsula. It's estimated that 40 seals are in or near the community. And now DFO officers are working on returning them to open water. Here now's Colleen Connors has the latest. Harp seals are still making their way into the brooks, streams, driveways, roadways in Roddickton Bide Arm. But now fisheries and oceans officers are trying to make their way to the community to move these seals out of the community and closer to open water. However, weather is playing a big factor here. The Northern Peninsula is facing a storm which prevented a lot of officers from arriving there today. That weather also delayed plans to fly over the area and survey the whole situation. Now that flight may still happen in the days to come. Officers are en route with plans to retrieve the seals and they hope to move the seals to open water in Inglee, which is about 16 kilometers from the town. Now there's always a few seals hanging around this time of year, but this time there are so many inland because they came in to feed closer inland and all the ice froze behind them. I'm talking about several kilometers of ice and the seals just can't seem to find their way back to open water. Now, officers have been in the community over this past week, removing some of the seals from people's driveways and bringing them to nearby open water. Now, officers want to get in the community, stay there for several days, really assess the situation and what to do with all these seals. But of course, that plan changes all the time because of weather and because of the number of seals involved here. It may be a lot less than 40. We'll know a lot more as the weather clears in that area. Colleen Connors, CBC News. Corner Brook. The Canadian Coast Guard says salvage crews pumped more oil from the Manolis L than was expected. When the vessel sank off Change Islands in 1985, it had as much as 600,000 liters of oil on board. Now, some escaped during that sinking and more leaked out during a powerful storm in 2013. In the fall, the Coast Guard announced that the end of an operation to clean up what remained of the oil on that ship. It was believed at the time that there was as much as 150,000 liters of oil still on the Manolis L. But today, the Coast Guard says, in fact, the salvage crew cleaned up more than 208,000 liters. That's enough oil to fill more than 1,300 barrels. Clearwater commits a gross violation. And now, North America's largest shellfish company has been convicted. Details ahead.
Welcome back, everyone. A little bit of business to get to before the weather. Uh, it's time to get rid of that Christmas tree if you still have your real one. In St. John's, you have until the 13th to chuck it at two drop-off locations. Chuck it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the city is accepting trees at uh, Robin Hood Bay as well as at a lot off the boulevard on the Kitty Vitty Lake. Yeah, and the trees will be chipped and then made into mulch for landscaping projects. Great recycling yeah. mm -hmm. initiative. It's true. I saw a guy had his tree on the roof this morning, which I think he must have put up last night. Uh -huh. and oh, it was no. like a glass statue on top of an SUV. Well, that would have been yeah. fun to throw, though. Yes, it would have. <laughs> that would have been a ton of fun. Yeah, mm -hmm. hear everything breaking. That is the best part, though, I think, about clearing all that ice, even though it is a pain, but clearing it off your car. I like the sound. I don't know. Yeah. It's satisfying. <laughs> Uh, but yesterday we were talking about the winds and how strong they were uh, for the Rec House area. Take a look at these numbers. It, it topped out at 143. This is showing 143, Ooh. but uh, I saw 153, 154 kilometer per hour gusts for the Rec wow. House area. So that's that's quite impressive. Uh, otherwise, we've got close to 100 kilometers per hour along the West Coast and then generally seeing those gusts between 40 to 70 kilometers per hour across most of uh, the rest of the island there. So if we take a look at the temperatures right now, jumped up into the mid single digits for the Avalon. That's why everything changed over to rain earlier today and everything melted. Otherwise, we're still hovering around the zero degree mark for Gander, below zero for Badger, and then along the west coast as well, sitting below zero up through uh, the uh, Labrador coast as well. That's why we're going to see that freezing drizzle through the overnight tonight. So here's a look at uh, the current satellite and radar. You can see a little bit if we zoom in how much uh, potential for rain tonight and then again that potential for some freezing rain and drizzle into the overnight hours towards the early morning hours as well. If we take a look at that future tracker best chance will likely be along the coast. Otherwise, we're looking at either rain or snow through the overnight. And then in that northerly flow, that freezing drizzle along uh, the coast and up through the northern peninsula. Otherwise, we start to get into this setup where we could see that southwesterly colder air moves in and then we start to see that snow squall set up. And that looks like that will continue uh, even into Saturday in some cases along the west coast with some long uh, term snow up through parts of Labrador as well. So here's a look at the watches and warnings right now. Blowing snow advisory up through Nain and Hopedale. That's where we're going to see the most significant snowfall and those stronger winds as we head towards Saturday. And then that freezing drizzle advisory, as I mentioned, uh, either looking at snow or freezing drizzle through the overnight, but things could get a little bit slick into the morning hours tomorrow as well as those temperatures still sitting below zero tonight are going to drop down to about minus three in St. John's light winds though, and then uh, some south winds for the West Coast 20 gusting 40 and then hovering around minus two down through the Buren Peninsula as well. And that's where we uh, could see either rain or snow as we head towards that number tonight. And then that potential for some freezing rain through Grand Falls, Windsor as well. Now up through Labrador are going to stay quite warm. Temperatures jumping up to minus six for Nain, minus five for Happy Valley Goose Bay. This is well above seasonal for this time of year and it will stick around for a couple of days. And then Lab City going to continue to see that snow and windy conditions tonight. Gusts near 50 kilometers per hour leading to blowing snow and minus 11. Then into tomorrow, temperatures are still going to be sitting around one, two degrees for most of the island along the west coast though cooler and then we get into that southwesterly flow as I mentioned so that potential for snow squalls uh, into the afternoon some southwest winds gusty winds near 70 kilometers per hour and then St. John's either rain or snow through the afternoon could pick up a couple of centimeters by the time tomorrow morning rolls around and then up through Labrador there's those temperatures again quite warm minus two minus three and then Lab City sitting around minus tens so those northerly winds near 40 kilometers per hour so why are we going to see the snow squall set up well uh, warmer air moves out and colder air moves in and then once we get that southwesterly flow anywhere along the southern coast the Buren Peninsula and the southern part of the Avalon could see some snow squalls Friday and into Saturday and with that we could pick up local amounts of between five to ten centimeters in those squalls otherwise up through Labrador uh, still looking at a good bet of between 10 to 15 centimeters by the time tomorrow rolls around for western portions of Labrador and then up through the northern portions we could see pockets of between 20 to 30 centimeters. So that combined with this, the uh, stronger winds will lead to the blowing snow. So let's look at your forecast for tomorrow. We'll look ahead a little bit towards the weekend, maybe another storm for next week. We'll have all those details coming up. Deb?
Thanks, Ashley. Canadian seafood giant Clearwater has been convicted of a gross violation in the lobster fishery after the company ignored explicit government warnings. A CBC News investigation found the company was repeatedly told to stop storing traps on the ocean floor. Federal Fisheries was enforcing a conservation measure Clearwater wants changed. Paul Withers has this report. This is the Randall Domino. It's the boat Clearwater uses to carry out its offshore lobster fishery. It returned to its home port of Shelburne this morning. This past September, the company was hauled into provincial court for the way it conducts that fishery. North America's largest shellfish company was caught storing 3,800 lobster traps on the ocean floor off the Nova Scotia coast in the fall of 2017. Fishery regulations say gear must be checked every 72 hours to prevent the unintended catch of lobster and other species. Clearwater left them in for upwards of two months, described this way in court by the Crown Prosecutor. The Crown submits that this was a gross violation. The practice of leaving untended traps in the ocean represents a serious conservation risk to Canada's marine resources, both commercial and non-commercial species. In this case, the offense was less serious because the traps were unbaited and partially disabled, although that did not remove all the risks. Aggravating the offense, Clearwater ignored warnings to stop. Evidence showed in 2014 the company stored 8,500 traps on the ocean floor for two months while its boat was in refit. DFO even boarded the Randall Domino at sea as part of its probe, which showed that leaving traps untended for long periods of time was common practice and the company was told to stop. Despite this warning, however, the practice continued. It just seems arrogant to, be, to, to ignore the regulator like that. Um, Environmentalist Shannon Arnold has raised concerns about Clearwater storing traps at sea. She says the department did the right thing. I think it's really important that the government gets out there and shows that there is a level playing field. They're not going to let you know, different parts of the fleets and different corporations versus independent fishermen play by different rules. The company pled guilty and was fined $30,000. It won't say whether it continues to store traps offshore. In a statement to CBC, the company said it is committed to sustainability. However, it said there is a recognition by industry and the regulator that the current 72-hour tending time is impractical for the lobster fishery, and as a result, DFO has initiated a regulatory amendment to provide flexibility around the 72-hour gear tending rule. The Department of Fisheries and Oceans declined to be interviewed for this story. In a statement, the department acknowledged it's looking at changing the 72-hour rule, but says while that review is underway, all harvesters, including Clearwater, will be expected to comply. Paul Withers, CBC News, Shelburne. It has a, uh, it has a habit of uh, making people go for a swim. The Terranova River has a way of capsizing canoes. Mm, an adventurous group paddled the lower stretch this summer and made a movie out of it. Meet them and find out where you can see this film for free after the break.
Welcome back to Here Now. Well, if you want to rip through the white water of a great Newfoundland river without getting wet, a new film about a daring canoe trip might just be the answer. It premieres for free in St. John's this Saturday. Four men, two canoes, and lightning fast water. I met up with two of these hardcore paddlers and started by asking them why they chose the Terranova River to shoot those rapids and shoot a film. Richard Alexander, you made this film. Why the Terranova River? Well, the Terranova is, uh, is a very special river to, to a lot of people in this province, particularly in our, in our paddling community. A good friend of ours, Jim Price, who passed away three years ago, he was the first to run that river in kayak. The lower section was never run in a, in a canoe, so uh, we thought it would be a good thing to do to sort of pay homage to our mentor and our friend, Jim Price, be the first group to attempt it and do it in a, in a tandem canoe. Okay, so let's talk about the goals, because obviously these canoes are fairly heavy. Corey Locke, who you'll see in this film, uh, you were one of the four men on this trip. What was the goal? The goal was just to do that, to, to actually canoe the Terra Nova. Um, previously, it's, uh, you know, it was kind of pioneered with kayaks. Uh, people go out and play boat on, uh, on the river all the time with, you know, short, maneuverable kayaks. But from a canoeing perspective, it's very technical, you know, requires a certain amount of precision. So we wanted to do it in long, fully loaded canoes. Uh, just the challenge of the weight and, uh, and to make those moves, that was the, the challenge for us. Right. That because we it's so easy in a kayak. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It I, is. I, I don't know. Sure. I'm not sure about that. Richard, what were some of the unexpected uh, challenges? Yeah. So if, if you're trying to do something that's that's difficult on a on a good day uh, in in a, in a canoe, you want to you want the conditions to be as good as they possibly can, which means that the water levels are at a perfect level. Uh, so when we we were waiting for the levels to drop on the river, and when we got there, they were probably about 50 percent higher than what we had hoped for. In the film, when you watch it, you can see the anxiety in the group. Uh, so for, for those of us who don't know a lot about rivers and rainfall, what does that do to the rapids? Oh, it, it makes them much larger, <laughs> larger, scarier, bigger, pushier. If you capsize in your canoe, you, you go for a longer swim. You can lose your boat. The boat can be hit a rock and get wrapped around it. So it, it takes the risk level up to, to, a, um, to a level where, you know, the anxiety is high and you, you have to make big decisions about your, your own personal safety. So it's, it's, it's very challenging at high water. Now you and your three compatriots, very experienced uh, in a canoe, what's it like to go down the rapids? It's exhilarating, you know, it's truly uh, exhilarating, it's exciting. One of the pieces that uh, is really satisfying is that you're a team, you're working with your partner. You become very cohesive as the trip goes on and so you push yourself as a team. And then if you can make those must make moves, it's very rewarding. So it's not just the water, it's teamwork. So. Now with, the, with the two canoes, so two men in each canoe, who decides which canoe is going to go down first? Uh, you collectively as a group you decide, but typically it's the, uh, the more experienced of the group because you know, they'll lead the way, they'll pioneer the route or the, the line, and then the other crew members will come down. Right, they can uh, go to school on, on your shoot. Yeah, right. absolutely, yeah. There was one particular set of rapids that was particularly challenging. Can you describe that for me? We knew even before we showed up the river that this famous rapid on the Terranova, lower Terranova, is called Stuart Staircase. And it has a habit of making people go for a swim. We get on the river and then we're paddling for three days and all you can think about is, okay, the water's rising. We're getting closer and closer to Stuart Staircase. We got cameras there, so it was like, we we're talking about running this rapid and then everybody's like, should we actually do this? Is this a really good idea or, or what, right? So. I'll let the people who, uh, who see the film know what happens right. here. There's something called Kodak courage, right? When you actually have the cameras? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. so my, my wife always says, you know, how do you get Richard to do something stupid in a boat? Get two of his buddies to do it first, right? <laughs> That's... <laughs> All right, last question for you. Uh, you mentioned Jim Price in the beginning of this interview. You dedicate this film to him. Why is that? Jim is a mentor. We, we do this type of thing. It's a big part of our lives now because of Jim Price. Uh, like I said, he was the first person to run the Terra Nova in, in kayak and uh, he passed away three years ago. Um, it's a very special river. Uh, Jim was very special to us, and the, the purpose, one of the big purposes of this film was to sort of document the, the first people like Jim and Mark Dykeman who, who went down the river and you know, link those two generations and, and kind of thank the previous generation for, for setting, us, setting us on this path. All right, I'll give some information about where you can actually see this film this Saturday here in St. John's. Last question to you, Corey. Would you do this again? Oh, most certainly. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's fun. It's actually near uh, as well. It's fairly close. It's only about two and a half hours away. Great river to go do a trip on and, uh, and challenge yourself. All right. Well, Corey and uh, Richard Alexander, thank you very much and uh, good luck with the film. Uh, thanks very much. Looking forward to people seeing it.
I'm looking forward to seeing it, but I would have to go in very calm conditions. Mm -hmm. you, you have to be very uh, skilled yeah, they, to they, do what they do. Yeah, they know what they're doing. The boats that were in the shed there, you, there's still some dings they'd fixed up, but they, they took quite a beating. I guess the question you're probably asking is, did any of those boats uh, actually make it through the set of rapids? You saw a little spill there, but what about the second canoe? Well, to find out, there's a free screening of rising waters. The film is about 35 minutes long, and it's on this Saturday night at 7 p.m., Hampton Hall Theatre, and everyone's welcome. It's at the Marine Institute, the Ridge Road campus, and uh, 35 minutes, you'll probably enjoy it. It's full of bacteria, and you can get sick, causes like diarrhea, eating problems, and all that. The federal government is putting $1.8 million into fixing boil water advisories in Indigenous communities. But that money will not help Garden Hill First Nation. That story in just a bit. Welcome back to Here and Now. The federal government has promised to ensure safe drinking water in First Nations communities. It's spending $1.8 billion to make it happen. Despite that, many communities still can't drink the water. And the reason? A lack of infrastructure and indoor plumbing to get clean water to people's homes. Connie Walker has the story from Garden Hill, a fly-in community 600 kilometers north of Winnipeg. Zachary Flett does what he can to help his family stay warm and safe this winter. But it's hard in a house with no furnace, no power, and no running water. I wake up 6 o'clock in the morning, I make fire, I get ready for the day. The wood stove helps, but living without water is a huge burden for Zachary Yay! and his grandmother Maggie. <laughs> We have to get water every day and we use about five or six pails. Keeping ourselves clean is pretty important in terms of hygiene and health. What about for the bathroom? I don't think you would want to see. It. <laughs> well, there's an outdoor. There's an outhouse there. Only half the homes in Garden Hill have piped water, but hundreds, like the flats, aren't connected and don't have any water at all. Hundreds more rely on a water truck like this. It delivers water to houses that have cisterns. Basically, a water tank just outside or underneath their homes. Those tanks are full. 
The cisterns were put in after an outbreak of swine flu in 2009. The federal government pledged $40 million to retrofit homes in the region. Now about a third of the houses in Garden Hill have cisterns and a sewage tank. Inside this shed is one of those new water tanks. So this house now has running water and indoor plumbing. Well, we've talked to a lot of people who have these tanks and say they still have problems. The pumps break, the lines freeze, and the tank runs out. And with only two water trucks servicing this entire community, they can wait a few days, a few weeks, even up to a month to get a refill. You don't drink this water? No, we don't. Why not? Because it's uh, sticky. Wallace Knott now has a cistern and running water, but that doesn't mean he trusts it. Put your hand in here. You can feel it. Sticky. Can I feel it? And feel your hand after. Oh, well, look, there's a film on it. Yeah. That's why it doesn't taste good either. And it's not drinkable. Or reliable. Wallace runs out of water nearly every two weeks. And sometimes when the water tank is empty, the sewage tank is full. When it gets too full, well, the, the sewage starts coming out of the bathtubs and it starts to get smelly in here. The federal government is spending $1.8 billion to end boil water advisories on reserves. Is this one running good? Uh, but that won't help the people in Garden Hill. They don't have a water advisory. There you go. See, it's turning the water from their treatment the plant is already so safe to drink. The, uh, there is chlorine in my system, it was Andrew Flett's job to make lot. sure of it. Every day. Okay. There's, there's no breaks, no holidays when it comes to this job. But he gets his water here at the community fountain. He doesn't trust the water in his cistern <clears throat> either. It's full of bacteria and you can get sick, causes like diarrhea, eating problems and all that. Have you gotten sick from the water? Uh, yes, we did a few years ago. It was severe with uh, my daughter and my wife because uh, when they would eat, they couldn't keep anything down. With so many barriers to access safe drinking water, Zachary knows that some people watching from their comfortable homes down south might wonder why he stays. Because this is home. No matter how bad things are, how people look at it and view it, this is home because not only of the beauty, not only of the history, but as a community, we choose to make this our home. Well, the Prime Minister faced more questions today about arrests of protesters at a pipeline blockade in northern British Columbia. Justin Trudeau says the arrests show the government needs to properly engage with Indigenous communities and build a new relationship. The way we are doing resource development, construction, uh, exporting of our resources uh, is changing in this country. We know we cannot do it without creating partnerships and, and, uh, and uh, engaging with uh, Indigenous peoples who are the uh, traditional custodians of, of these lands uh, without uh, thinking deeply about the environmental consequences and the long-term impacts of the choices we're making. And this is very much something that our government is moving forward on. On Monday, RCMP arrested 14 people who were blocking access to an area where a company wants to build a natural gas pipeline. And Trudeau says he knows there are going to be questions about the actions of the police, but he says it's time to figure out how to make sure there's proper engagement with communities on this kind of project. And Trudeau was heckled about the issue at a town hall meeting in Kamloops last night. Thousands of Canadians could be eligible for compensation for defective plumbing parts, and they may not even know it. Makers of Kitech Piping agreed seven years ago to pay consumers $100 million for leaks and floods caused by their products. But few people have even applied, and so far only $3 million has been paid out. Yvonne Colbert has the story. Kitech pipes and plumbing fixtures were sold between 1995 and 2007. The products were used primarily in homes with in-floor and hot water baseboard heating, and replacing them can be costly. 
Since the North American Kytex settlement seven years ago, less than $3 million of the $100 million available has been paid out. Class action lawyer David Robbins says despite a campaign to inform people, he suspects the low number of claims is because people simply don't know the money is available. He says so far, only claims for leaks or flooding are being paid at a rate of 50%. Payments have been intentionally small because no one knew how many would apply. In Canada, 485 claims have been paid, ranging from a low of $10 to a high of almost $150,000. Most, though, are in the hundreds or low thousands. However, those payments may increase next year when the claims period ends in January. At that point, the courts will determine how much more homeowners will receive. And even if there is no leak, Robin says people should apply for compensation. Any money left over after claims are paid will be returned to Kytec and its insurers. Yvonne Colbert, CBC News, Halifax. Here's a look outside. Things are not quite as slippery as they were earlier well, a lot, today. A lot less snow too. A lot less snow. Oh yeah, mm. gone down about 30 centimeters of snow. Wow. Yeah. But uh, it does look like we've got another system on the way as we head into next week. We'll have all those details coming up. This weather update is brought to you by Beltone, helping the world hear better. So we are going to get to the weather in a minute because mm -hmm. we're looking ahead now to the weekend. But first, the official Feed NL totals are in. Well, as you know, CBC partners with the Newfoundland and Labrador Community Food Sharing Association at Christmas time to help bring in donations. And boy, did you deliver this year. There were more than 10,000 pounds of non-perishable food items donated and 1,449 turkeys. 
The association has been asking for monetary donations in recent years, so that's what Feed NL focuses on. And this year, the grand total. Need a drum roll. Yeah. <laughs> one hundred and thirty-six thousand dollars. Uh, no, one hundred and thirty-six thousand four hundred dollars. That's almost thirty-four thousand dollars more than last year. So thanks Amazing. to everyone. Yep. Yes. So thank you to all of you. Christmas, of course, a crucial time of year for food banks, and those holiday donations often keep them going through the winter and that money is going to be a great help because it's not just about December it really goes right through the winter into the spring the food banks uh, need some help so thank you very much yeah nice mm -hmm. nice to hear that we had that nice total there yeah uh, but I guess everybody kind of wants to know what the weather's going to be like for the rest of the weekend uh, absolutely <laughs> always important always important yeah uh, if we take a look at the future tracker we are looking at that potential for some snow squalls and that will generally continue as we head through the day on Saturday as we get more into a southerly flow southwesterly flow that's what I'm thinking most of those snow bands will make their way towards Corner Brook and and then even for parts of Buren as well, again, through the day on Saturday. And then even more so into the evening hours as well. We'll see those persistent bands continue along the West Coast. We could pick up uh, some significant snowfall with these anywhere between 5 to 10 centimeters over the next couple of days. Uh, and then as far as your temperatures go, we're going to drop back down to uh, around zero for St. John's. And then sitting in the mid single digits for the rest of the island, minus four in Corner Brook. And then up through Labrador, we're going to hang on to those uh, warm temperatures again, minus six uh, for Happy Valley Goose Bay, Nain, minus Minus three again with um, some more wind expected and then that snowfall we could see some blowing snow into the afternoon and then it looks like Lab City will be sitting around minus 14 through the day again that risk of flurries into the afternoon so looking ahead through the overnight Again, more snow up through Labrador and then again along the west coast and then in that general southerly flow with those cooler temperatures we could see some snow squalls again and then into Sunday afternoon as well. It looks like we'll see a little bit of clearing at, into Monday, maybe a few lingering flurries, but then the next system moves in and right now it looks like it'll be uh, some snowfall for parts of central and then eastern Newfoundland will eventually see things change over to rain into the evening hours as we get into that southerly flow again and then it pushes off and in behind that we could see some more snow. So uh, this one could be another big event. So here's a look at the forecast over the next five days. Temperatures tomorrow again could potentially see that risk of freezing rain and then a quick two to four centimeters for parts of the Avalon in eastern Newfoundland hovering around two degrees tomorrow. Saturday that chance of flurry. Sunday a little bit of sunshine potentially and then into Monday as well with just a slight chance of a few flurries dipping down below zero and then Tuesday, you see that temperature warming up into the evening hours, so we could see rain or snow changing over to rain into the evening. Now, for uh, central Newfoundland, those temperatures are going to dip into Saturday and Sunday down below zero. Minus 12 is your overnight low on Saturday, so quite chilly. And then that potential for some flurries continues right through the rest of the week, even into Tuesday, likely seeing light snow and minus three with that overnight low sitting around minus 11. Now for Western Newfoundland, generally gray over the next couple of days, and that's because we're gonna see that potential for some snow squalls. Could see five to 10 centimeters uh, in for tomorrow and then Saturday as well. Sunday looks like uh, about minus four, minus five on Monday. And then up through Labrador, we're looking at uh, those warmer temperatures continuing right through Saturday. We're going to dip back towards seasonal as the beginning of next week rolls around, but generally looking at that potential for flurries. And then same for Western Labrador. A little bit more sunshine on Sunday, though, and 18 degrees. Look at these overnight lows dipping back down to the minus 20s and minus 30s even by Tuesday. So let's look at your long range forecast. We'll look at your weather photo when I come back, Deb. Thanks, Ashley. It became known as the Big Maple Leaf Heist. In 2017, thieves took a massive gold Canadian coin from a German museum. The coin was issued by the Royal Canadian Mint and held a Guinness World Record for purity, 99.999% gold. Well, today, the four men accused of stealing it went on trial in Berlin. Briar Stewart has more. When the four suspects were led into court this morning, a crowd of cameras greeted them. 
Each of the young men held a magazine up to block out their faces. They're accused of carrying out what has been called a spectacular heist. And this was the target, a 100 kilogram gold coin known as the Big Maple Leaf. It was made by the Canadian Mint in 2007 and its owner loaned it to a museum in Berlin where it was on display. That was until March of 2017 when it was stolen. Police allege that the suspects used a ladder to climb up to the third floor where they broke through a window of the museum. They say at that point they somehow managed to smash the bulletproof glass that this coin was encased in. Police say they used a rope and a wheelbarrow to get the coin out of there. Police say three of the suspects are all related and they come from a family that's well known to police because several of the family members have criminal records. Police say the fourth suspect was a security guard at the museum and he's accused of scouting out the site and giving tips to the others to help them carry out this plot. Now this trial is expected to last for 12 days and as for the gold coin, it has never been recovered. Investigators believe it was likely melted down and broken apart. They believe all of those individual pieces could have been sold for as much as six million Canadian dollars. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Well, you need to remember something? Well, next time, try drawing it. New Canadian research finds that the simple act of drawing something instead of writing it down boosts memory and it boosts memory for people of all ages. CBC Health reporter Christine Birak explains. We can all draw, maybe not as well as Diana Robson here, but when it comes to your memory, you might want to grab a pencil. I get carried away with the details and the, it, it's a, a process that leads somewhere, whereas writing, you're just writing it down. She's right. A new study says drawing can light up parts of the brain that writing just doesn't. Using a series of short tests, researchers found drawing can help you remember new information significantly better than repeatedly writing it, picturing something in your mind, or even looking at images of it. When you're drawing, you're basically thinking about the way something looks, so that's going to use parts of the brain that are involved in visual processing. Okay, all right, so okay. we're going to start the experiment now. <laughs> all right, I'm ready. Okay. To better understand it, we did a short test, drawing versus writing. Random words appear and you have 40 seconds to write it repeatedly or draw a picture of it. Clearly, I'm no artist. You drew this and you also drew this. In the end, I'd recalled twice the number of words I drew over the written ones. I can see how there's a real difference in the way I'm processing that information for yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. The drawing effect also worked equally as well for participants over the age of 65. And early results show drawing can also help dementia patients retain new information. What we think is that drawing is, um, involves a lot of this visual perceptual processing, so it's recruiting these posterior regions here. As we age, critical brain structures involved in retaining memory deteriorate, including our frontal and temporal lobes. But visual spatial processing is done in the back, in the occipital lobe. This area remains mostly intact during normal aging. Even if their drawings were, you know, virtually incomprehensible, they're, they're still showing this effect. This neuropsychologist now wants to figure out how to use this information, whether it's a grocery or to-do list. There's a lot there, it's a big effect, and it's so simple. Um, we will figure out how to apply it. Robson helps seniors get creative and says this year she might change the way she pens her New Year's resolutions. I might try making images for those resolutions. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Even oh. if you're not a huge fan of winter, it's hard to deny that that picture is exactly where you want to be right now. Wow. Exactly what I was thinking, <laughs> where I would love to be. Any Beautiful. idea? No. <laughs> it's not the Avalon. It's the West Coast, yeah. yeah. All right, well, I'll tell you where this wonderful photo was taken when we come back.
<laughs> Welcome back, everyone. <laughs> So we had that gorgeous, gorgeous picture before we went to the yeah, break. Yeah, we're going to take a look at that this one more time. This is where Debbie time. would rather be. <laughs> I must say, I haven't done enough. We keep getting this rain, I thaw know, thing. and it gets rid of it. Mm -hmm. Pasadena is where that beautiful photo was taken. Just oh, enjoying lovely. an absolutely stunning winter day. This was actually yesterday, so. Oh, really? Yeah, We're that's kidding. what Joe says. So it, it must have been very secluded, it looks like it, because they had a lot of wind yesterday, didn't yes, they? Yes, into the evening hours. The winds picked up, and then I'm sure all that snow was off the, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> off the trees there. But yeah, gorgeous shot there. Thank you so much, Joe, for sending that photo in. If you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca, and we'll try and get them on the show. Yeah. Okay, try to forecast some weather like that. Some more Please, snow. Okay. Ashley. I will, I'm working on it. So already heading into Friday's show already. A week has gone by very quickly. <laughs> Thanks yeah. for sharing it with us. Have a great night and see you tomorrow. Good night.